the formal union of a man and a woman, typically recognized by law, which they become husband and wife. However, that age-old definition is coming under fire. I would like to just be married. Um, I also look forward to the day when I'm not former lesbian dead mother, but just Jen. There's a sense of joy because we're seeing a, a lot of historic movement here. Some of the shift comes from staunch Republicans. I uh, had a change of heart based on uh, a personal situation. Yet many still believe traditions set thousands of years ago should remain the same. I still believe marriage is between a man and a woman. The poll still would indicate that the vast majority still believe that marriage is between one man and one woman. Tonight, we discuss marriage. Should it change or remain the same? Good evening from the Ohio Union. Bob Kendrick here along with Yolanda Harris. Welcome to our ABC6 Town Hall on same-sex marriage, which of course right now is right at the forefront of the social and political debate in this country. Absolutely. It's a hot button issue. We're expecting lively conversation tonight. But first, let's take a look at these latest polls. A Fox News poll says 49% are in favor of legalizing same-sex marriage. Pew Research numbers look like this. 49% strongly favor same-sex marriage to 44% who strongly oppose. And CBS News claims 53% of those polled say it should be legal to allow gays and lesbians to marry. Of course, there are many who still feel that marriage in this country should be defined as that between a man and a woman. And it is uh, crossing all different boundaries, the debate, the social, the emotional, the religious, the political, all issues that are brought to bear by the debate. Civil rights issues, human rights Certainly. issues, actually. We've gathered a large audience here tonight, but you at home, you can also take part in this because social media is a big part of all this, and we invite you to participate as well. You can ask questions and make comments through our social media, Facebook, Twitter, and our website, abc6onyoursite.com. We've got a hashtag here for you tonight, hashtag your voice, your future. Again, if you're going to be joining us from Twitter, hashtag your voice, your future. And now let's get the discussion started here tonight with our audience and moderator, Mark Hyman. Mark? Thank you, and good evening. I'm Mark Hyman, host of Behind the Headlines and the moderator for Your Voice, Your Future Town Halls. We're coming live from the campus of The Ohio State University. Tonight's town hall topic is same-sex marriage. It's passionate, it's emotional, it's personal. We have a, an excited audience here that we know have lots of questions they want to ask and want to address this issue. And again, as Bob and Yolanda mentioned, you can join us from home going to facebook.com slash WSYX ABC6, or you can use or you can go to Twitter. Our hashtag is your voice, your future. The comments and questions you send on social media, we may ask on air, so please join us. Now, we have a fantastic panel of experts who are going to explore and discuss this topic. So let's go ahead and meet them. Joining us tonight is Ian James, co-founder of Freedom Ohio. Elizabeth Holford, Executive Director of Equality Ohio. Greg Davis, Pastor of Southwest Baptist Church. And Ken Klukowski, he's on the faculty of Liberty University School of Law. I'd like to emphasize to all of our audience that our panel members are here in their personal capacities and the views they represent are their own unless they tell us otherwise. Now typically in a town hall meeting we start off with questions from our audience put to the panel members but we're going to do things a little different tonight because I want to challenge my audience here tonight. I want to get your opinion, your responses to a question. So throughout the evening I'm going to have a couple snap poll questions and I want you to respond by the sound of applause. My first snap poll question this evening, and you have three choices and answers. The answers are civil rights issue, religious issue, or both. So those who believe this is a civil rights issue, please applaud. Those who believe it's a religious issue, please applaud.
Those who believe it's both, please applaud. I actually want to put, this, I want to put the same question to our panel members by a show of hands. Is this a civil rights issue? Religious issue? Both? <laughs> so you can see there's actually a lot of divided opinion on this. I want to come to our first audience member question of the evening. Sir, please step on over here. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and ask your question. My name is Stephen Snyder Hill. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. And ask a question. Okay. Uh, I see that you brought, sir, your uh, Bible tonight as the basis of your arguments against same sex marriage. I brought my U.S. Constitution as my basis for this first question. And that is um, Article 1 of the Bill of Rights basically gives the freedom of religion. And I want to know if if you don't understand, or if you could explain to me the harm of religion trying to dictate law, because if any one of the 20 religions in the, in the world decided to be the one that, that dictated law, that could take away your freedom or take away your right to marry or your different individual freedoms of liberty, how, how can you justify that you be the one that tried to do that to, uh, to Americans? Do you understand or say the question, Pastor? I do. Okay. And. Uh, <clears throat> I guess the Bible gets noticed, doesn't it, when you bring it to a, a place. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned our, our founding documents, and I'm glad that you brought the copy of the Constitution. You remember that our founding fathers rightly wrote and reminded us that we are endowed, our rights come from our Creator. Our rights do not come from any document that our nation produces. Our nation can protect rights, but our founding father said that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the best place for us to find out what rights our creator gives us is this Bible. Because in Genesis chapter number two, God said he formed Adam of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And he left Adam alone for a time. And after Adam felt the aloneness, God made for him a helpmeet. And the Bible says, in the beginning, God made them male and female, husband and wife created he them. And then God gave parameters for that relationship. Now this is all from our creator, which our founding fathers knew. The parameters for that relationship was not that they could just live however they choose or make marriage whatever they choose. God designed for one man and one woman to join together for one lifetime to bear children, to be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Now you fast forward uh, to, to uh, Mark chapter uh, number 19. But Jesus reiterated his views on that. And, and I, I guess I'll just conclude by saying, if I'm picking sides, I want to be on God's side and Jesus' side. Amen. Amen. Ian, is there a disconnect? Can you support same-sex marriage and not be on God's side? Well, I'm actually a, a child of the clergy, so you know, I, I actually have the position of, I think it is also a, is a civil right, but it's also a religious, uh, there's a holy matrimony and there's uh, civil matrimony. And the pastor actually, uh, you know, he's eloquently spoken about why it's religious to him. But what he hasn't talked about is how he has a, uh, a license to marry people. He paid ten dollars and September of 2005 to have a, a license that so that he can marry people in his church and have that marriage be recognized by the state. That's really what we're talking about here, is having marriage recognized by the state of Ohio and the government. You can get married in church, and people that want to be married in church should be able to do that. But you shouldn't be in a position of stopping people who want to get married to go to the, to the courthouse and be married and get the license for $45 and then have the marriage performed by an officiant such as yourself who's paid $10 to the Secretary of State and then have that <laughs> marriage license be executed and taken to the probate court. So I'm a firm believer and I'm a, I'm a strong proponent of yours to have your religious right and, and our amendment, the Freedom to Marry and Religious Freedom Amendment actually respects and protects your right to continue to perform marriages unfettered. You have the right to perform the marriage and, and recognize it and as much as you wish. But so should another church who feels that a couple who's the same gender 
should have that right to be married. Or, as Steve was saying, you should be able to go to the courthouse and be married. This is a civil right. It's also a religious matter. But we respect and protect your religious freedom. We also ask that you honor the civil rights of others and you provide the family security this, that comes from marriage. Before we move on to the next question, and I know we'll probably address this later in the, in the uh, town hall, but Ian, where does your amendment stand at the moment? Is it being introduced as a part of any legislation, or are you moving it towards a referendum? It, it's been certified by the Attorney General. It's been approved unanimously by the uh, ballot board, and it's survived a Supreme Court challenge. That trifecta shows that we're really moving things forward. You can't really do that that well in Ohio often. Uh, we're collecting signatures. We'll qualify in more than 50 counties. We'll have the necessary signatures to file. It's ultimately going to depend on uh, timing, resources, and, and I'm sure we're going to come back and discuss that a little later in the program. I Looks hope like we're so. staying with the religious theme at the moment. Sir, please tell us who you are, where you're from, and what is your uh, question. My name is Gary Click. I'm pastor at Fremont Baptist Temple, Fremont, Ohio. And I'm glad that Steve brought his constitution with him. He's a great guy. We had some good conversation earlier. But um, the thing is, is this is a constitutional crisis. The Constitution protects and secures organic natural rights, which are self-evident. This isn't self-evident which is attested to by the fact it's a great big discussion. And your Open question, and your question me, is? Is in states where it's been legalized already and even where it hasn't been legalized, they've been forcing, it's not just about, as Ian said, protecting churches, but protecting Christians. Uh, freedom of religion, the free exercise of religion doesn't just belong to churches, it belongs to individuals. So why should a member of my church be forced to lease their land to you, to bake their cake, to make your flowers, to take your photographs, which is what is happening, and it is infringing upon our freedom of religion, not just in churches, but as Christians, and that's the right that is protected by the Constitution, not the right for gay marriage. Uh, Elizabeth, does, this does, does same-sex marriage infringe upon the religious rights of others? It doesn't. It does. uh, there's, there, it doesn't. And there is no indication that it does. And in fact, I, uh, I'm appreciative that you would bring up and refer to the Bible and refer to Jesus and to God. And that is a wonderful thing about the Constitution. But not just Christians are protected under it. We have religious freedom in the United States for all religions. So if you start from that basis, and then you go back to the Constitution, what else does it protect? Well, there were a lot of things in the Constitution, just as there are a lot of things in the Bible. But in the Constitution, we also are free to interpret it. And for a long time in the United States, marriage was defined as, and in fact, we were, as women, property. When we got married, we became the property. We started out as the property of our fathers, and then we were the property of men. And we could not inherit, nor could we take care of our children if our husbands passed. Well, we've changed that interpretation. And up until 1967, interracial couples were not allowed to marry. So we are always have been able to not only have a constitution that protects all religions, not just Christians, but also we have been able to have the intelligence, the foresight, and also the ability to respond to not a constitutional crisis, as it was referred to, but to the society that we live in and the rights that should protect everyone equally, just as the Constitution protects all religions equally. Ken, do you agree with Elizabeth? Well, Elizabeth is actually uh, perhaps a little bit off on our constitutional law, as was the, the gentleman's question a moment ago in two regards. First of all, uh, the First Amendment protects two types of religious liberty. Uh, no establishment of religion and the free exercise of religion. No establishment is that the government could not pick one particular religious creed and coerce people to become part of it and lend their financial support to it. It never extended to people being able to make moral judgments from whatever source they derive those religious or otherwise. The other, of course, is the free exercise of religion, which the other pastor just referenced. The provision of the Constitution that has not been raised is the religious test clause. 
that no person shall ever be denied holding public office because of their religious views. The founders understood that if you elect someone, you elect the whole person. They might be an atheist, not have any particular religious faith, or they might have a specific faith. And if so, when there are social policy judgments that have a moral dimension in it, that faith is going to inform that judgment. Now, regarding the 1967 case, that's actually not true. Interracial marriage was legal in many states, but it was also illegal in some states. And in some states, it had gone from being legal to illegal or the other way. And so when this came to the Supreme Court in Loving v. Virginia in 1967, the issue was there was a law that did not allow a white man to marry a black woman. And, they were and a couple was prosecuted for having been married. When they took it to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court held that three amendments were passed after the Civil War, the Reconstruction Amendments. One of them was the 14th Amendment, and that the purpose of the 14th Amendment was to eradicate all laws of racial discrimination. And that this was a textbook example, this went to the core of what the 14th Amendment forbade states to do. So when speaking about a fundamental right to marry in that case, it was specifically in the context of eradicating a, a type of law which we the people had inserted an amendment into the Constitution to do away with. So it's all about popular sovereignty. It's not at all that we reinterpret words that are there to impose some entirely new meaning that's never been there. If, if gay marriage is a constitutional right under the 14th Amendment, then it's been a right since 1868 when the 14th Amendment was adopted. Every law that defines marriage as one man and one woman has been unconstitutional since 1868, if that provision, if, if in fact that argument is correct. The whole reason we have, and this will be my closing point, the whole reason we have a written constitution, it's the oldest one in the world, it was the first one. The reason we adopted a written constitution was so that we would have words on paper that would not change letters on paper that everyone would know, these are the powers of the government, these are the rights of the people, and we could hold all of our leaders accountable to abide by that charter of government. And it doesn't mention gay marriage at all. Before we go to social media, I want to get one more question in from our audience. Please tell us who you are, where you're from, and what is your question? Peggy O'Brien. I'm from Palo, yeah. Ohio. Thanks. And I guess I'd like to address to Ian or Elizabeth or both. And I just wanted to find out exactly what you would define marriage as. Let's go to Ian. How would you define marriage? Marriage is a relationship between two people. It is a commitment. It is a public statement of love. It is when two people say, I, this is my soulmate. This is who I love. My husband's here. We were married in 2003 in Canada. Uh, he is the closest person to me in the world. He is the person that I would uh, walk over fire for. When you find that one person who you love and you want to be with for the rest of your life, uh, and you say, I'm going to make a public commitment and a statement with my family or, or the community, and you, you enter into that agreement, that is marriage. That is marriage. Pastor, can you disagree with that at all? Well, I'd, I'd like to follow that up with a question. I'd like to ask Ian, and, as well as Elizabeth, sure. uh, how do you come up with the definition of marriage? I, uh, I just did, and I actually... No, wait, wait, what where, I, where did it originate? Oh That's what I want to know. Where, where did you get it? <laughs> My... This is what I'm saying. Does marriage what, become just what our heart feels it is? Well, what marriage actually is, is the, is the best way for a couple to be able to care for and protect each other, especially in a time of crisis. That's ultimately what marriage is. I mean, if you really want to boil it down, it is ultimately the best way for a couple to protect themselves and care for their family. Why a couple? Why a couple? Yeah, there are more polygamous marriages in the world than there are than there are gay marriages. That, and and polygamy is legal in 50 nations all around the world. It's been around for thousands can of years. Be that Why as do you it may, it as be that as it may, we, actually the Ohio uh, Freedom to Marry and Religious Freedom Amendment is very clear on that. Is two consenting adults, not near of kin than second cousins, not having a husband or wife living. Why two? Because that is what people believe should be. And we and we oh. do not we do not we do not agree as the Freedom Ohio we do not agree that it should be three or more. So now, if it was three or more, if it, ask you this, if it were three or more, Ken, would you actually say we're for that? 
I, I, I I'm I interested. I mean, I are you married to there three are, well, or more the people? Second lar- the second largest religion on earth has, has legal polygamy, and that's why it's legal in 50 nations around the world, which is four times as many nations as recognized gay marriage. Uh, if, if you have a two an, people if are the you most have a stable, man, Ken, actually, two people are the most stable. Well, two people who are love each other, committed to each other, two want pe- to live together, two people want to be able to protect each other, and want to be able to take care of their the family. Biological parents of their children. Those two people should have the right to be able to be married and care for each other. But the issue in, in marriage right. law is deciding what relationship. It, uh, society has an interest in marriage because we have an interest in children. And it's to create a stable environment which recognizes the biological fact that every child is the result of one male and one female. It's to create a stable environment where those children can, can be raised. And the sociological data is overwhelming. You should tell that, that to my mother who was in her mid-70s and married a wonderful man who they live here in town. They're not not going to ever have children. Yeah, they're not going to ever have children. But they love each other. They love each other. They're watching tonight. Hi, Mom. I love you. Bill, I love you, too. They love each other. They want it to be together and from sickness until death. Are there are plenty and, of and that's, couples that but don't that's, have children. Are, we, we we're, don't we're require gonna leave, that. We're going to leave the marriage definition here for a moment because I suspect we're going to hear this a lot this evening because I want to do is I want to bring Adam into this because we're getting a lot of social media contact. A lot of people want to weigh in from all over the state. So, Adam, what do you have for us? Well, as you mentioned, uh, Mark, there is a ton of social media coverage on this issue throughout the last several years. On Twitter, we've been asking you to use hashtag your voice, your future. We've gotten several questions over the course of just the last 20 minutes, including one that's for the entire panel, and it's from Harrison. He says, how would marriage equality impact each one of you? Mark? Elizabeth? Well, I'd be really happy, <laughs> first of all. And the reason that I would be really happy is because uh, it, it is something that in my life I never thought I'd be able to do. And when I think about it, and I will go back to marriage definition for just a minute. When I think about it, I think about the definition of marriage, the attributes that the Supreme Court talked about in the 1987 case, that it's the expression of emotional support and public commitment. That's something I've never been able to do in my life with a partner. It's of spiritual significance, and for some people, religious, uh, the exercise of their religious faith. It's the expectation that for most, the marriage will be consummated, and it is also the receipt of tangible benefits, including government benefits and property rights. That's what equal rights are about. It is both uh, an emotive, a public commitment. It is also a spiritual commitment and the recognition thereof. And it is also about being able to be treated equally under the law, the same as everybody else. Pastor, do you agree? I do not. And, and I, you know, one of the uh, disappointing things about many of the issues that we're facing now is, is the wordplay that we, we do. Yes, you know, the word equality, here, here's, here's the fact. Everyone in this room has the right to marry. Everyone. There's not one person that is, that is denied the right to marry. The fact is, if you want to marry, you're a woman, you marry a man. A man <laughs> marries a woman. I, 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 take, I, I do take some exception at, at this idea that, in, that we live in a country that takes a, a, an individual for the color of their skin or something and says, well, you're not equal to us. That's not what our country is today. But what this issue is about is a redefinition of it. So l- let me explain it this way. Uh, when we came in tonight, there are public restrooms out there in, in the hallway. Everyone is able to use the restrooms. No one's discriminated against. But men go into men. And women go into women. All right, we're back to our studio audience with a question, sir. Please tell us your name, where you're from, and what is your question? Uh, name is Randy Klein from Cincinnati, Ohio. And good evening to everybody. Uh, it's a hard thing uh, to tell someone else how to live. You know, that's a very hard thing to do, to tell other people that they're wrong or whatever. So I want to bring in a practical side. Uh, every, in a question form. Every three, every three months, I give blood. And I've been doing it for years. 
And when you go to give blood, you answer a questionnaire where they ask, have you had men, if you had uh, sexual contact with, a ma with another male even once since 1977, that's enough to disqualify you from giving blood. So your question My is? My question is, since it costs to treat a person who comes down with, uh, with AIDS or HIV in their lifetime over $600,000 for the drugs and treatment, should Christians and other people who disagree with the homosexual lifestyle, should they be forced to pay through Obamacare for that treatment? All right. Well, we're a little off topic, but uh, maybe let's talk in general about benefits. Um, can, are there benefits that should be available to same-sex couples, whether they're married or not married or in just some sort of committed relationship? Is it, how, how do we cross that bridge for people, let's say they're, let's say in a state where they're not permitted to marry but they're committed same-sex couples, how do they get benefits that perhaps married couples get? Well, there's two types of benefits. There's private and public. In terms of uh, uh, child custody, uh, hospital visitation rights, uh, transfer of property uh, when someone dies, who their estate goes to, uh, all of that can be done through private contractual arrangements. That's what wills are for. The law creates certain defaults if the persons involved never engage in any contracts, but those default rules are overridden. You can give power of attorney to someone, you can give durable power of attorney, you can name someone as the sole beneficiary of your estate. So all of those private benefits can be, uh, can be contracted to freely between any two persons. That has nothing to do with same sex. Uh, siblings can do it, best friends can do it, business partners can do it, any, anyone can do it. And it doesn't have to, again, doesn't have to just be two. You can even uh, specify more than one person. In terms of public benefits, there are certain benefits that cannot be confirmed aside from marriage. And one of them is the presumption of paternity. In all 50 states, the law is that if a married woman gives birth to a child, her child is presumed at the moment of birth to be also be the child of her husband. At the moment of birth, he has all the rights of a parent over that child and all of the obligations of a parent regarding that child. If marriage were, if government were out of the marriage business, and we were just talking about private rights, when a child was born, they'd only have one parent, and it would take uh, DNA testing, blood testing of both, the, uh, of both the purported father and the child, and then a judicial decree before a second name could be added to the birth certificate. So one of the aspects of marriage is to recognize the biological reality that a woman was involved and a man was involved, and it's to commit both of them to the long-term raising and protection of that child. It's also for the protection of the mother, uh, who often, uh, of course, childbirth is a traumatic experience, as anyone in a yep. family uh, knows, or in the tragic inc uh, uh, incident where a mother dies in childbirth, that father then becomes the only child, to the, the only parent to take so we'll care of that child. We'll have to leave child. it there, because I want to get I Ian's take on this. Geez, you're going to have to go back to the question because I'm not sure exactly where we left this off, honestly. Well, well the start. question is, that what a, about benefits? A long answer, How do we get benefits to, <laughs> to say, in the case of a state where marriage is not permitted for same sex couples, should there be an opportunity for those couples to have benefits that married couples enjoy? Everybody should have the right to the same benefits as another. You're discriminating against someone because of their gender seems to me to be inherently uh, biased and, and wrong just from the, on the face. You know, people love each other. They want to be committed to each other. They wish to be a, a recognized as a family. You don't want to have that? That's fine. That's great for you. But don't impose your will or your, your theology or, or your faith on me especially when it comes to a civil contract and a civil marriage. I mean, because ultimately, ultimately, yeah, ultimately the, you know, what, what this is about is, as I discussed with my husband, you know, I want to be able to care for him, his sickness and the health, until death do us part. That, those are the vows we took. 
and we're, we're going to share time a little bit because that was a long answer. And when you talk about, do not call it equality, that I can do contracts with my partner, that I can do powers of attorney, that I can do this, that I can do that. The estimates, conservative estimates for me to do that with my partner are that I spend three hundred dollars to $500,000 to do that. Mm. That is not equity. That's not equality. That's a penalty because of how I was born. One, one other quick thing here. When my husband Stephen and I actually set up these contracts that you're talking about, uh, you know, it we it spent, didn't cost you three hundred thousand. No, it? no, but it did cost a good us. Lawyer could do that it did cost afternoon. us uh, about eighty five hundred dollars. Yeah. So when you're talking about the equity here, and, and someone can go down to the courthouse and get a forty dollar marriage license, so that you can use your marriage license, you pay ten dollars from the Secretary of State to, so that you can then file that uh, marriage certificate with the probate court. I don't have that right to do what I have just outlined, but I did have the right to spend $8,500, and I still don't have nearly the number of rights that you have and you enjoy. And, and God bless you for having a, a married life and, and kids and, and a family, and I, and I applaud that. But I can't sit here and, and rationalize why you don't want me or my husband to have the same rights. Not to be recognized in your church, that's that's your thing. And, and I support your church's right, your religious freedom to say, we're not gonna perform, we're not gonna recognize, that's what our amendment does. But don't tell me I can't marry the person I love and I'm committed to. Don't do that. Before we move on with our next audience member question, just with all due respect to our, to our panelists, if you could all tighten up your answers a little bit, because I have 100 people here all, all want to get questions in, so we want to hear from them as well. We're going right back to our studio audience, and then we're going to have to go to our social media desk, because we hear Twitter is absolutely blowing up. But please tell us your name, where you're from, and what is your question? My name is Paul Feeney. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and my question is this. I appreciate the concerns of the previous speaker about using Obamacare as a way to force heterosexual or Christian people to pay for HIV and AIDS care. As a gay man, I would ask, what is my responsibility to pay for uh, cervical cancer or pregnancy or childbirth? It is all of us. It is all of our responsibility to pay for the health care of the human race through Obamacare as a concern, as a going concern of society. And, 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 your, and your question is? We don't is? get to pick and choose the ailments that we, that we uh, address through our health care. So my, cons my question to you would be, uh, which, which uh, bits of health care would you deny to a gay couple raising a child in, in, in your health care plan? And the moderator is going to exercise his prerogative. It's our last Obamacare question of the evening. We're not talking Obamacare. Tonight. But real quick answers. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask the pastor just to jump in this for a moment. Really short answer on this because we want to answer his question. No more Obamacare, okay? So this is about what what medical care we should pay for. Yes. No. no. Is, that, is that what the question was? I I, I don't believe. What you would deny. That's what he said. Deny. A, a gay couple raising a child, is there something you would deny in terms of medical care to their child? That I would pay for as employer, who is this? Policy. Oh, policy? I think that's up to employer, an employer who he wants to, uh, what he wants to pay for. We're talking about the government. Obama. Obamacare. Like, oh, Obamacare? I, care I don't think the government should pay for that care at all. I think, I think this whole Obamacare is certainly not the direction yeah, we should Yeah, well, you know, we're going we're to leave it here on Obamacare, so no more questions on Obamacare. Yeah. We'll save that for the next town hall meeting. But right now, our Twitter is blowing up. I want to go back to our social media desk. A Adam, what do you have for us? Lots of questions, uh, to say the least, Mark. Uh, the question about the definition of marriage really spurred a lot of conversation. Uh, several questions on this. One was from Ashley out in Sharonsville, Ohio. She says, I am a transgender woman, born male, but living as a female for the past five years. Which gender should I be allowed to marry? Uh, Ken, uh, and keep it a short answer. Yeah, uh, that issue is in court in Arizona right now. There is a, tr uh, a woman who is a transgendered man who married another woman in Hawaii. Now she's demanding an Arizona divorce. And the Arizona judge said, 
you're two women as far as Arizona law is concerned. I can't grant you a divorce. And she is saying if that's the, if that is how you define it, I'll take this all the way to the Supreme Court. So again, it gets past the whole live and let live thing. It is that even where the people do define the laws a certain way, uh, now we're being asked to reaccommodate. She is genetically a woman and she still bears children. She actually kept from the waist down uh, her, uh, her female uh, parts. So she's a woman. Elizabeth, care to weigh in on this one? Uh, two things. Uh, you should marry whichever gender you wish. And uh, the example that Ken, Ken used with, with uh, marriage being uh, legal in some states and not in others points to exactly the problem. We should have marriage equality nationally. This is a great time to ask my second snap poll question of the evening. Recently, the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments in two cases regarding same-sex marriage. The first was a challenge to California's Proposition 8. The second was the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. So regardless of how they decide, regardless of whatever opinion the Supreme Court uh, hands down in a matter of months, my question to you by a sound of applause, and your choices are yes or no, will the opinion they offer settle this matter? Those who believe yes, please applaud. Those who believe no. And I suspect that the entire audience is correct in this one, that no matter what is decided, this is going to be an issue that's going to be argued in, in courts for a long period of time. Let's go back to our audience. Please tell us who you are, where you're from, and what is your question. Hi, my name is Doris Dorica, and I'm a former teacher from Cleveland, and I'm also a history buff. And I have two questions. My question's twofold. In the course of civil, human civilization, hasn't uh, the homosexual lifestyle also been done in ancient Rome? And what were the results of that? And my other question as a former teacher, how would the homosexual lifestyle be taught to our children K-12 to in Ohio? Okay, so uh, Ian, um, does it, is there an issue with respect to... Um, the teaching is in school? Well, here's, here's the reality. In our 46 word uh, freedom to marry and religious freedom amendment, there is no curriculum clause in there about teaching anybody anything about uh, people that are gay or people that are straight. So, and, and really, when it comes right down to it, children learn their values from their parents at home. Okay? I think that's kind of where we're going with that question on the latter part. As far as gays in history, yeah, there have been gays in history from the dawn of mankind. It's not a new phenomenon. Uh, in fact, in fact, there have been a lot of really famous gay people. You see them a lot on the screen. You also see them in the history books. I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the question was, what the relevance was of it, <laughs> except to say that. You know, there have been gay folks around us forever. Pastors, right? should people be concerned about if this is taught in school in some form? A absolutely, and I, and I appreciate Ian's positive, uh, you know, thought to this, but history proves that, that the morality of our society always reaches into our public school teaching, always. That's right. It's evident with the passing out of condoms to our kids of recent years. Uh, we, don't, we don't do that with this amendment. Well, I understand. Nor do we teach kids how to be gay. I understand. <laughs> Just saying. Throwing that out there. I, I understand your amendment doesn't say that, and I appreciate your positiveness that it won't happen. But can you promise it won't happen? It, the 46 word amendment happen? speaks to exactly what it, it, it will happen. Can you promise it won't happen? Look. If you, want, if you, yeah, if you want to have an amendment that actually requires the teaching of homosexuality in schools, you have the right as a resident of the state of Ohio to circulate any petition you want. This amendment doesn't do that. So the answer is you can't promise. This amendment does not the, require the, the teaching is, is, is of this, people uh, that, to be gay or states, not gay. And this teacher is taught in Cleveland knows that it does reach its way into the public schools. <laughs> our, the sensitive ears of our children do hear it, and especially when our nation as a whole if we were to put our stamp of approval upon this lifestyle and it becomes law, 
our public schools are going to follow that law. There's no question they will. And for us who are, who are uh, a strongly uh, uh, in, in favor of the, the, what, what traditional marriage does, it's a, it's a stabilizer for our country, uh, we fear what will be taught to our children in school. I wish people would stop talking about homosexual lifestyle and get serious about the fact that, for me, this is the way I was born. And secondly, if we are going to talk, if we are going to talk about schools, then we need to talk about the fact, and particularly in Ohio, of the rising levels of bullying around issues of Absolutely. people being treated as they are gay, whether they are not they are. They are or because they are gay. We have rising levels of violence in our schools right now, and we are not addressing it. We don't have any, anti, any enumeration of our issues in the anti-bullying law in Ohio. And we also, we accept as, as, as a statement that because there is marriage equality that something will be taught in the schools. That's not how our society works. It is not how our schools are controlled. That's why we have school boards. That's why we go through curricular activities. I've been a teacher. I've taught in a college of education at a university. I know how change happens in schools and it wouldn't be gay marriage and oh my gosh, we're going to teach everybody how to be gay now. It's, that is just, that's unrealistic. And I am making a joke of it because that's not how the system works. It's a little kooky. All right, let's, let's leave it there for a moment because I, I suspect this is gonna come back up again. But let's go back to our studio audience. Please tell us who you are, where you're from, and what is your question? Hello, my name is Jennifer Patterson, and I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and I'm going to be attending the Ohio State University for law school. I was brought up in the Methodist church, and I was taught that God was growing someone for me to share my life with, to love, to support, to have children with, and to most of all, have, a God, have God in our household. I've been brought up that whole, my whole life my parents are both devout Christians and very conservative. I myself am gay. I'm asking you today, do I get my rights? It's a very sensitive subject to me because I one day want to have a wife where I can love her and cherish her and have the same rights as everyone else. Whenever my children go to school that they're not picked on or that whenever I go out into public as a lawyer, defending most, I mean, gay people, heterosexual people, everyone, because this is a human right, do you think that I should be denied that? Looking in the face of a person that is gay and who is going to have a family someday, no matter what anybody says, are you going to deny me that right? Ken? Well, I can speak more to the legal end than the, than the theological end. I'll, I'll leave that to Greg. Um, my question would be, uh, on the legal end, uh, how, how are you defining uh, marriage in, in that regard? Because I still have not found, uh, I still have not found a legal rationale. When you're in law school, you'll learn that all legal judgments must be an application of neutral legal principles. There is no principle under which you can say that gender is no longer an element in a right to marry, but that the number two is. And there's already litigation in Utah right now with people who have, are in federal court right now arguing if there's a right to gay marriage, then there's also a right to my polygamous marriage. And not just man and woman, multiple men or multiple women. So I, uh, so I guess my question would be, do, do all of those people have the same right to define marriage however they choose? Yes. I, sir, to, say, to answer your question, I am not looking to get hordes of wives and just to carry them around with me. I, when I was seven years old, I woke up and I knew that I loved women. I bet when you were five or, or six years old, you were playing on the playground and you loved little girls. When I was playing on the playground, I loved little girls, okay? It was, I was born that way. I, I don't want to have multiple wives. I want to share my life with one person. Well, what of someone who does? Do they have the same right? That's, that's not the subject at all. Oh, it's certainly the subject. That is the issue. That is the issue in law and in courts. That's what, as a lawyer on this litigation, that's what we're having to wrestle with right now in court. Well, just a note about that. I, I'm glad to hear that's a real case because I think it's John, John Turley's representing yeah, them, right? Yeah, Jonathan Turley's right. representing them. And he's representing, it's really great, he's well. representing the... Um, 
I, I just, it's, it's great. You probably, He's you probably some, know about this because you're a TV, you're, you're a TV person because they, they are. He's representing the family of the sister wives, and they were going to on the reality show. They might have lost their next season, and I, I thought it was a joke that they brought the loss. So I guess it's a real but, loss. But, and there are multiple Amazing. lawsuits. But polygamy uh, isn't really the question Muslims. here because that is not what we are debating, and polygamy is also not the question in our society right now. It's a, it's a great dodge, though. No, no, it's, it's a great not dodge, dodge, though. It's a Ken. question it of what absolutely, is the constitutional Ken, right. If you lived in Ohio and you had the the ability to vote mm -hmm. on this amendment, I'm sure you wouldn't, but uh, you wouldn't vote for it. But the the amendment, the Freedom of Mary and Religious Freedom Amendment, you can find it at freedomohio.com. Read about it. Uh, actually, <laughs> says that two consenting adults have the will have the freedom to marry two. You, you are hung up on three, well, four, and agree. five. And, and we agree that society we do. draws lines. We, we just draw them in different lock, places. You're lock that down. That is like, true. that is society historic. Society has often changed those lines. Okay, uh, this is going to bring me to All my right. next snap we poll question of the ground. evening. And your choices and responses are yes and no. My question is, the real threat to marriage is divorce. Those who believe yes, please applaud. Those who believe no, please applaud. Oh. We're going to go right back to our audience for another question. <laughs> Sir, please tell us your name, where you're from, and what is your question? David Borders from Columbus. Uh, it seems like God's the only one that doesn't have any rights left in America. Yeah. <laughs> My question is this. In light of the fact that we, a Christian nation, have now expelled God from our schools, from our government, and now we're trying to expel him from our marriages. My question is this, do you think we will suffer the same fate as Sodom and Gomorrah? Brief responses to that one, please. Ian? Well, I, ultimately, I think only God should be judging. Amen. Only God should be judging. If you're, if you're a person of faith, I was a, I was a preacher's kid, only God should be judging. Secondly, the Freedom of Mary and Religious Freedom Amendment makes it very, very clear that no religious institution shall be required to perform or recognize a marriage. If you don't want to have someone get married in your church, you don't agree with the marriage, you don't want to perform it, recognize it, you should have that right to say, you know what, we're not going to do that. But again, you shouldn't have the right to say that a loving couple who wants to care for and protect themselves, especially in a time of crisis, should not have the right to go to the courthouse and get married. That is an overstep for you. That, and frankly, what, the, what Ohio's Constitution did in 2004 was government telling churches, houses of worship, who they could and couldn't marry. That's an overstep for government, and we can repeal it, and we will. Pastor, do you agree? I, I do not agree, and it is... I'm shocked. It, it is true. <laughs> you know, it seems like the, the, um, it seems like the, the one thing in this, in this meeting that is marginalized is the traditional family. Oh. Nobody speaks about the traditional family. Nobody talks about the traditional family. We're from I what, did. I what, actually what, applauded what, your family. What, what makes society healthy is when a man marries a woman... They stay together for a lifetime. They bear children. Those children marry their children. That is the stabilizer of civilization. And the more we break away at that foundation, uh, the worse off America will be. Now, we're still getting a lot of social media on this. A lot of folks from not only here in Columbus, but also in Dayton and Cincinnati and elsewhere throughout Ohio want to weigh in this debate. So let's go back to our social media desk. Adam, what do you have for us? Well, Mark, we have plenty of questions. Uh, when you're using the hashtag Your Voice, Your Future on Twitter, we've seen several comments, and a lot of them revolve around the consequences, both positive or negative, of allowing same-sex marriage. And so the questions that have been proposed to the, uh, or posed to the panel involve the, uh, the consequences, both positive and negative. Ken? 
Well, I mean, all over, and part of what I do is add something of a national perspective here. I don't live in Ohio, so I'm not just focused on this amendment, more broadly the issue. Uh, right now in Washington State, the Attorney General is going after a florist who, despite the fact that she has gay customers, she's employed gay people, because she's an evangelical Christian, she's chosen not to provide flowers for a gay wedding. And the state attorney general is coming after her, imposing a fine on her, and demanding that she sign a letter that she will start servicing gay, gay marriages. Uh, there's a baker in Oregon, same thing. There's a photographer in New Mexico, Elaine Photography, where they don't even have gay marriage or gay civil unions. And yet she has been assessed a multi-thousand dollar fine. It's before the New Mexico Supreme Court right now. Two graduate students in Michigan and Georgia have been expelled from counseling programs for declining to counsel same-sex couples a Vermont bed and breakfast was, was uh, assessed a fine for refusing to host uh, a gay commitment ceremony. I could go on and on. These cases go all over the country. So when someone says there, there are no religious liberty uh, dimensions here, the reality is that uh, people of traditional faith, evangelical Christians, Catholics, and Mormons, and people of other faiths as well, are right now having the coercive power of government coming down on them if they choose to express their faith in how they conduct their business. That thing is not a part of the amendment. Hold on. Actually, I'm going to put you in the spot for a moment, Ken, because now's a great time. Ian, I want you to read the amendment that you're, you're addressing. Please listen carefully, and I'd like to see if this might solve some of the issues that, that Ken's addressed. Mm -hmm. In the state of Ohio and its political subdivisions, marriage shall be a union of two consenting adults, Ken, Two. <laughs> not near of kin than second cousins, not having a husband or wife living, and no religious institution shall be required to perform or recognize a marriage. And it's important to understand those 40 simple 46 words, because not only do they repeal and replace the 2004 marriage ban, that is 55 words, so we're actually getting clutter out of the Constitution, but we're also making it very clear that it's only going to be two folks who love each other, committed to each other, can be married, but also, well, you're not going to have uh, polygamy, you're not going to be marrying your cousin. I'm from Southeastern Ohio, that does affect me a little bit, right? <laughs> so, I, I know I took a little exception when we wrote that, but uh, the reality is it's not going to have uh, this uh, undue consequence. You're, you're talking about religious persecution of people. Uh, that's not in this amendment, first of all. That's not in this what amendment, first of all. It's not in this amendment, Ken. And the second part is that, that what's going to happen is people that love each other are going to be able to get married. Okay. That's what's going to happen. All right, now. They're going to be able to care for and protect each other. They're going to be able to take care of each other. They're going to be able to to live their lives. I've been married for almost 10 years. Okay. I don't think it's had any, I'm and, guessing, and no and impact on your I life. want to take the second half of that amendment, yes. just for a moment, because I want to just go back and explore this. Now, Ken addressed some issues in some various states. The second half of what he addressed, that, that religious um, uh, entities would not be forced to in, participate, would that protect people in those states if that kind of legislation was in, in effect? Uh, not at all. It wouldn't protect people here either. There's nothing in that language that says if you run a secular business, like a photography business or a bakery or a floral shop, that if you choose to run your secular business consistent with your own religious faith, there's nothing in there that protects right. those. That language only protects churches and synagogues. It doesn't protect uh, private sector businesses. Right. Right. Well, it doesn't deal with driver's license either. That's beside the point. Those people. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out: is what is your what I is laid your out point? Are not all of the instance, instances that I just laid out? Not a single one would have been protected by your amendment. It'd be a field day in terms of how religious people choose to live their daily lives. Not only that, if it is a federal constitutional right, then the federal government can also strip away even the protections that you do have there. That happened in Bob Jones University versus I'm US. I'm sorry, we're not going to get your support on this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to leave it there in this issue. We're going to go back. We have only a few more moments for another question because it, we're going to have to take a break just to go uh, leave the network broadcasting and we'll continue. But before we get there, I want to go back to one more question from our studio audience. Please tell us who you are, where you're from, and what is your question? Hi, my name is Hillary Brewster. I currently live in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I moved here three years ago from Pennsylvania to pursue a doctorate in education at The Ohio State University. I'm finishing in June. And 
I'm gonna get a little personal because I'm gonna do it to make a point. Um, I'm one of those awful, terrible divorced people. And the reason I got divorced is because I changed my mind about having children. I'm also an atheist. How come I could get on a plane right now, meet a stranger in the Vegas airport, go through a drive through chapel, come back married, and Ohio not only recognizes my divorce, they would also then recognize my marriage. I could also... <laughs> with a partner who is religious, which I am not, that atheism thing tends to shit, you know, shy away from the religious folk, he and I could probably find a religious institution that would marry us even though I'm divorced, I was certainly not a virgin on my wedding night and I didn't get stoned to death. Um, so how come Jesus spoke about no divorce, but divorce is legal in all 50 states? And, and your question is? And how, how do you get through that legal and religious quagmire about divorce? I think it's a tough question, but uh, you know, Pastor, um, and, and we're going to probably, we won't be able to get through all your answer here because we're going to be running short on time at the moment, but um, how is there this di disconnect between what a heterosexual couple can do, as this woman addresses, versus what same-sex couples cannot do? And, and she addresses some of the legal uh, religious aspects of it and certainly legal aspects. Well, let's take the subject of divorce first. Divorce is not the ideal. And divorce is, is one of the things that is eating away at, the, at the, the solid foundation of marriage. So no one here is saying that divorce is good. No one here is saying that adultery is good. And we're also saying that homosexual marriage is not good. I mean, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's, it's, it's not an issue of, of, of being mean or, or whether there's something in society that, that has been affected by sin. There's many things in society that's been affected by sin. And we, we make our way through that. Uh, but, but to answer your question, Jesus said he allowed divorce because of the hardness of men's hearts. It's the same today. Divorce is because of sin. It's because of sin problem in the world. The ideal still always has been, the ideal always will be, one man, one woman for one lifetime. Not for long. I want, I want to bring Elizabeth to minutes, and just so you know, we may have to interrupt you just for a moment because we're going to have to sign off on our network programming in a moment, but uh, if you want to join in, what are I appreciate your thoughts, that in the United States that you can hold your beliefs, your religious beliefs, and state them here. That is part of being in this country. And the other part of this country is that I am not here and we are not here to eat away at the stability of the country or at the institution of marriage. The institution of marriage has always been a flexible concept, changing and growing. That's how it has been. That is how it continues to go. And for me and for us, and marriage equality is about adding to stability, adding to family stability, adding to the ability to bring up loving families with the same protections, the same rights, the same benefits, and the same abilities as everyone else. Okay, I'm going to toss it for a moment to, to Bobby and Yolanda because we actually have to end our ABC6 broadcast. We'll be continuing on, but Bobby and Yolanda, please. All right, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening and participating. This is the end of our live broadcast of the ABC6 Town Hall meeting on same-sex marriage. But we will continue this discussion on our website. And for that, you can continue watching at abc6onyourside.com. It's been great to see how spirited the debate has been, been respectful for the most part. And I think we agree that it's been respectful. And as uh, Mark was saying, our social media is blowing up tonight. So many more questions coming as well on Twitter tonight. Again, the hashtag, your voice, your future. Bluetooth and rearview camera come standard. On the Honda Accord, Civic, CRV, Odyssey, and Pilot. How's the residual value? Stellar. What about the ride? Smooth as the night. Like a swallow on the Ganges? Like a gazelle in the Sahara. Comfort? Like a fresh laundry sweater on a brisk autumn day. Like a hug from Nana. Love, Nana. I can get all that now? Sail in soon. A deal like this won't last for long. I'll be out in the cold. Like a wet pair of boots. I prefer my boots dry. So do I. The really big spring event ends soon. Get a great deal now on a new Honda. KBB.com's best overall brand. Since 1945, Pennington's been a part of American pastimes 